Thank you so much for joining me for today's Relax. It's just cat grooming. I'm your host and instructor with the National Cat Groomers Institute. This is the show where we talk about your burning questions about grooming cats and running a successful business doing it. I have a special guest joining me for today's episode, Gracie Owen. Gracie is a certified feline master groomer. She's a certifier for the National Cat Groomers Institute. She's also an instructor in pet CPR and first aid through Pet Tech, and she is the owner of Upstate Meow, a cat-only grooming salon in Greenville, South Carolina. Did I leave anything out, Gracie? Nope, that was an amazing introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm super excited to have you. So in today's episode, we will be discussing three questions that we as cat grooming instructors get asked all the time. One, I'm a total beginner with cat grooming. Where do I start? Two, how can I get a cat used to the grooming process? And three, what muzzles can you use on cats? If you enjoyed today's quick chat, then make sure to click the notifications button in the National Cat Groomers page so you can get notified when we post new videos and content just like this. The first question is probably one of our most frequently asked questions. I'm a total beginner with cat grooming, where do I start? Gracie and I are gonna break down exactly for you how we would recommend that you not just dip your toe into cat grooming, but we're gonna talk about the cannonball, the whole enchilada. We don't want you to be a cat grooming dabbler. No, we want you to become an amazing cat grooming ninja, just like us. First, you need to know the basics, all the background knowledge before you even put your hands on a cat. This includes understanding feline temperaments, behavior, and body language. You'll need this information for literally every cat, not knowing how exactly how to handle them, but also to understand what they're reacting to and how to adapt the groom to bring you and Kitty closer to a successful grooming relationship. So since you need to be the cat grooming expert, you'll need to learn all about cat breeds their coat and color, how those affect their grooming needs, and their schedule options, their personalities, and what makes each breed unique. Because trust me, the fastest way to lose a client's trust is to have no idea about their cat when they walk in the door. Because honestly, once you become known as an amazing cat groomer, all those purebred cats are gonna start to come out of the woodwork. Persians, Himalayans, exotics, Maine Coons, Norwegian Forest Cats, Ragdolls, Siberians, Devon Rex, Cornish Rex, Sphinx, Burman, Balinese, Siamese, Burmese, Singaporeans. Those are all the breeds that I have personally seen and groomed in the salon. So if half of those breeds just sounded made up to you, then you'll definitely need to brush up on your breed and color terminology. In addition to all that, you'll need to learn about health and recognizing symptoms of common feline illnesses. You should learn about if and how those conditions can be transmitted to other cats in your salon. Do you need certain cleaning procedures? Does the groom need to end and the cat go to the vet for treatment? This isn't saying that you should be making diagnoses, diagnoses but you will most likely be the first one to see these things. I just groomed a cat a few weeks ago and I've groomed her a few times. Um, they've gotten her and her brother groomed for years. Literally, she's a six week client. She came to me that way. I was, I'm, I love that. But a few, uh, at the last groom, when I was doing her nails, I noticed that one of the toes on her back foot seemed really off. And I brought it to mom's attention who, she kind of just brushed me off at first, but I really insisted that I felt that there was a possibility it was broken um, or there was something else going on. It just seemed really strange. The cat wasn't excited about me touching it, but not trying to maul me either. But um, if they have a broken toe, it can actually lead to a lot more damage other than just being uncomfortable. So I really insisted that she should probably get it checked out. Well, it turned out to not only be broken, but they ended up amputating a portion of the toe to test for cancer. Luckily, the test came back negative, but the mom isn't really able to see those small furry toes. So knowing when something looks off and bringing it to my cat owner's attention is really an important aspect of what we do as cat groomers. 
So once you learn all of this background information, what's next, Gracie? So next thing you're going to need to do is to get training on how to learn each grooming services for the cats that come into your salon. First, you want to learn how to assess your cat. You want to make sure that um, they are the right temperament. So if I find a, a cat that's very tense when I scruff them, that's going to be more of an aggressive cat. If they tend to duck away, that's going to be more of a skittish cat. So knowing that's going to help you to determine the, determine the groom that's best suit for them. Secondly, I'm going to look at do they have any mats on their, on their, in their coat? So if they have pelting, I'm going to need to know about that before I say, oh, it's going to be $62 and it's just a full coat group. And then they come back and the cat's matted. I mean, not shaved because it was matted. You don't want to do that. So I like to show them that they're pelted. We don't want to do that. No. Exactly. We don't want to go shave cats without the owners knowing exactly. that that's what's going to happen. So you want to know what um, condition their coat is in and make it easier on yourself. If you do find that there's matting on their stomach, don't do a full line cut, please. <laughs> Just do a belly shave because why make it harder than it needs to be? And then thirdly, I'm going to look at do they have any sensitive spots on their body? So if their hips are messed up, I'm going to want to know that. If they're having shoulder pain, I'm going to want to know that. Especially if they are matted. If I do have a cat that's matted and they are really arthritic and when I touch it, they kind of scream. I'm not going to want to groom that cat. So it's better just to take them to the vet to where they can either give them pain medications while they shave them, or put them under. Um, also, knowing where they have sensitive spots on their body, you can manage the groom differently. So I actually had this cat who came in. She comes in every like six to eight weeks. And I started noticing that her shoulder was messed up. I'm like, oh, that's odd. Like she didn't want her when it touched. And then a couple weeks later, she took her to the vet and she actually had bone cancer. So now we have to move the groom around to where it's more comfortable for her and just switch it up. Um, so knowing that is definitely going to help with the, with the grooming. And then um, secondly, when it work, knowing the temperament of the cat will help you decide which handling techniques will be best for them. So if I have a skittish cat, I'm not going to be like <laughs> swing, like scruffing them like crazy. I'm going to hold them cr closer to my body. If I do have a cat that is more like, ooh, don't touch me, I'll try to keep most minimum handling I can possibly do on that cat. Or if I have a very explosive cat, I'm going to try to stay in more control of that cat and keep them closer to my body. Because once they start flinging and going crazy, you really can't come down from that. That is the truth. Once, once they have gone off the edge of the cliff, there is no coming back. So our goal is to try and prevent them from escalating. And so that's definitely where I think it's important to get hands-on training with someone who is qualified. So someone like myself or Gracie, we are part of the National Cat Groomers Institute's approved trainers and certifiers program. And you can go to either us or you can go to one of the other approved trainers or certifiers in order to get hands-on training to do this all in person. Because I don't expect you to just kind of learn through osmosis, you know, if we touch our heads together, of what I'm thinking and the problem solving that I walk through in order to work with each cat. Those things really need to be done in person. So you're gonna take that background information and you're gonna combine it in person and getting some training. So if you're a beginner in cat grooming, it's really important to kind of do a one-two punch of background knowledge and hands-on instruction. And then after you do that, Gracie, what would be the next step do you think? So I would definitely start practicing to get make yourself more um, confident because cat grooming is scary. <laughs> Especially when you first start out, you're like, oh my God, this cat's going to maul me. So what I would do, I would start with your own personal cat. And so just start off easy, nothing crazy, just do a nail trim. Once you start getting comfortable with that, do nail trim and nail caps. And then once you get comfortable with your own cat, start doing a little bit of handling techniques different ones like in the syllabus there's going to be tons of different uh, handling techniques you can use. You can also work on your friend's cats and then you can even get crazy and go down to the shelter. <laughs> and the, but the more you do the more confident you're going to get. 
and you're going to get faster. You need to get better. <laughs> yes. Yes, it all kind of, it builds on top of each other. So the more that you can actually do and start to figure out yourself, and like Gracie said, you start with the simple things that can go really quickly and you just gain speed as you do them. So nail trends, and honestly, that's what I like to say to beginners is go down to your local shelter and especially the small young cats are wiggly, but they're not really like, trying to eat your face when you're trying to do nail trims. It's really like, you know, it's, it's wiggly and it's hard and you learn to use the muscles that you're going to be using for bigger cats and for more complicated grooms. But you start with this kind of these small cats who are not going to injure you very easily and you're helping the shelter. And it also gives you a healthy respect with working with cats because the whole idea isn't just hold them down and force them to do something or to squeeze the life out of them. You know, we have to kind of respect them as far as the appropriate amount of pressure. So when you're working with small cats and you can kind of work with more and more of them, you really learn very quickly that what is appropriate and what's not appropriate for cat of that size. So a lot of times you don't need to over, you know, overdo it as far as handling. So you can practice a lot of stuff, you know, practice combing them, practice putting them on your lap, practice putting them into positions before you ever introduce the clippers. Because if you're trying to, if you've never really worked with cats before professionally, or cats that weren't your own cats and you knew exactly how they could do, and you try to add clippers into the equation by yourself, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. So that's where we really think it's important for you to work hands-on with someone so that when you're adding these really sharp pieces of equipment or you're working with cats that have really sharp teeth and really sharp nails or they're matted or they have thin skin that can easily nick, having someone else there to support you and to kind of help you through it. So it really, it really helps to make sure that you're not injured, the cat's not injured, everybody's happy, and it's just going to go so much better. So, but after we kind of go through all those things, um, so you've learned the basics and the background knowledge, you've gotten training from experienced cat groomers, and you've started practicing at home. The next step that you should you should take is certification. If you have followed the steps, um, you are well on your way to joining the elite club of certified feeling master groomers. In an industry that lacks standards and regulation, not only will you have the title to set you apart from your competition, but the skills to back it up. Um, and really the best way to do all of these things is to start with the complete cat groomer training syllabus. It includes your study materials of more than just the basics. We want you to really become that cat expert. It includes um, videos and tutorials of all things cat grooming, line cuts, comb cuts, belly shaves, bathing, drying, nail caps, you name it, it's in there. Plus you get access to a private student Facebook group to share your experiences ask questions, and get support from the National Cat Grimmer staff, trainers and certifiers just like Gracie, and other CFMGs and students who are going through the journey just like you. Whew, that is a lot to do, but remember, the first step really is with the syllabus, and that is going to put you on a very clear trajectory to becoming an amazing cat ninja. So the next question that we're going to be discussing is how can I get a cat used to the grooming process? So I really feel that you can't have a well-built house without a sturdy foundation. So first things first, you need to create a quiet, calm space in your salon to do your cat grooming. You need to be able to focus and comfort the cat as needed or make adjustments very quickly. I know sometimes that when we groom dogs, it's kind of like being on autopilot. It cannot be that way for cats. It is especially important during the first few, intro, uh, first few grooming appointments for each cat to have that focus so that you can make sure you set them up for a really positive long-term relationship. So the next thing you'll need to do is work on introducing each section of the grooming process slowly. I know it's going to take more time, but trust me, it will pay off in a big way down the road in the long-term relationship for that cat. 
In previous episodes, I mentioned the process for introducing the dryer, but I do similar things for any loud portion of the grooming process. I want to get them comfortable in a way that I can handle them, so this doesn't mean just holding them down. Some cats want to be snuggled and comforted, just like Gracie said. Others will need a bit of firmer pressure in order to prevent any freakouts, because we don't want freakouts. So I get them comfortable, then I introduce the louder thing, so a clipper, a dryer, a bath hose, whatever it is, from as far away as I can, so from further away. Then I gradually move closer or turn the pressure um, or the sound up gradually, so that way they're kind of hearing it from further away and then it gets a little bit louder or a little bit um, more pressure if it's in the tub. Um, also, I need to be ready to use both hands if the cat starts moving or thrashing around. So you need to be able to calmly and confidently get them under control before you move on. And this might mean letting go of the tool that I was using. So my clipper or my hose or the dryer nozzle, whatever it is. But really what I try to do is put them in a good position for that cat um, before I get whatever tool it is um, in my hand. So it's kind of, I get them into position, I make sure they're comfortable and make sure it's appropriate for that cat. And then I pick up my tool. So Gracie, what in your opinion is next? Definitely is getting used to handling your cats. So, um, what I like to do is practice, um, like practicing specific holds. So your body gets used to, they call it muscle, muscle memory. So what I like to do <laughs> When I first started out, I would take my cat and just put her a whole bunch of, whole bunch of different positions. So that way your body get you, gets used to it. And when you do have that cat that's scared and you have to reposition them, it's going to be 10 times easier because your body knows what to do. And then um, if you, let's say if you don't have a cat because in the beginning I didn't, <laughs> um, you can always use like a stuffed animal. As crazy as that sounds. And you, you might practice with your um, pressure and see how that works. And just do yoga, cat yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Kitty yoga. No, I totally agree about the muscle memory. It really is if you wait until you have a cat that is feistier or is more difficult or is more nervous and unsure, and that's the first time that you're trying a new position or a new technique, it really isn't setting you up for success and it's not setting the cat up to be confident in you. So practice these things on cats that are more pliable, I guess, like they're easily handled or like Gracie said, a stuffed animal, just to help you learn how to move differently with your body because this is gonna to be totally different than anything with dogs. Because everything with dogs is like on the table and it's at arm's length. But with cats, we do a lot in our laps or a lot kind of hunched over the table. And so it's really important for you to start practicing those things um, before you get a cat that absolutely really needs it. So you will be much more confident if your body already knows what to do. So is, if that wasn't enough for you to do, you'll also need to keep in mind what temperament the cat is, shy, compliant, or aggressive, and use that information to predict how the cat is going to respond to the grooming process. Then as you go through it, you can make adjustments and remember to take excellent notes on what you did how it worked or if it didn't work, and then what you can try at future appointments. So I have to make sure that I really take excellent notes for every cat that I do, and I do it for every appointment because I wanna see the progression that this cat is making, and my memory honestly isn't the best. I'm a little older now, and I you know, need to make sure that I'm writing these things down because I will forget. And it's not that I don't care about that cat, it's just I will forget. So taking really good notes so that way I can review and see what happened the last two grooms will really help to jog my memory. So finally, you need to get your client on board. You need to create a grooming schedule that solves the problems for the client, prevents issues for the cat, and it will create a consistent event in this cat's life, the grooming process. It's not this big scary thing that only happens when the cat's already in pain or there's already a problem. It is something that happens all the time and it's just a natural part of this cat's life. 
Once they know what to expect and they've been properly introduced to the different parts of grooming, they will most likely relax and really settle into the routine. Now this isn't to say that every single cat will become compliant, but they will certainly become a lot more predictable, which is just as good. <laughs> I'd rather know what I'm getting into right off the bat instead of having to play detective, which takes a lot longer and can be much riskier. So speaking of risk, the third and final question that we're gonna be discussing today is what muzzles can you use on cats or what muzzles do you recommend using on cats? So I'm gonna start with this one. It is the green e-collar by Smart Practice. So that's a little half half little muzzle. So it is their version of an Elizabethan collar. And I really like this one. It is, I use it quite a bit as what I call a tester for new cats and especially for small and really wiggly cats where another my muzzle might just be overkill. They're really inexpensive. So I usually have a couple just tucked in different places around my salon. Um, you can literally get them for like a box of under $40 and like six. Um, but keep in mind, they're not meant to last you forever. They're kind of these small flimsy ones. I really like them for nail trims because, you know, if I have the cat laying on the table and the muzzle is like this, you know, am I, you know, I'm just trying to get to the front feet. It's a really nice kind of quick muzzle to pop on if I think that a full face muzzle might be too much for that cat. So this is really nice. However, and this is a big but. This is really not going to provide you with 100% bite protection at all, even on those small cats. So especially on larger cats where their face, like their head is just going to be like up here, not going to provide me a ton of protection once I move away from say around the neck or around the front feet because they can turn around and now kind of I'm exposed to them. And if I'm not paying attention and I reach across them, I can easily get bit with this type of muzzle. So you have to kind of keep in mind that um, this is not 100% by bite protection. So um, unlike this one, so if I'm trimming nails and let's say I have a new cat and I get them out of the carrier and I put this one on and I'm trimming their nails and they start kind of that low growly rumble, um, like the warning sign, it is time to upgrade to the full face muzzle. Um, and I'm gonna to upgrade to our favorite muzzle, which is the air muzzle, which is the one that I use when I'm concerned about, about being bit. So, do you, see, do you see Bandy here? Hi, Bandy. What are you doing, where are you? Hi. Sorry, she's behind me. <laughs> Bandy, what are you doing? You gonna be my demo? She's so silly. So Gracie's gonna tell us about the air muzzle. So I'm gonna be Vanna White. So the air muzzle is my best employee. Like Lynn said, <laughs> like Lynn said, um, it is a full coverage protection against their mouth so they can't bite you. And um, as long as you correctly put them on, you're not gonna have any troubles with this. So when you are putting on the air muzzle, you want to make sure that you make it tight enough. So what you want to do is going to put one fingertip underneath the back of the neck. If it's any looser than that, the cat will fling it off. A second thing you want to watch out for when using the air muzzle is to make sure that when you are using it and they go like this, that you unhook the paws because you don't want them to actually get caught and rip out a nail. We don't want that. <laughs> so once they do that, I like to kind of put, I like to rearrange them, see if I can kind of do it, with their head behind my arm, my elbow, and the front legs in the front of my arm. That way they cannot reach the air muzzle. But another great, another great thing about the air muzzle is that if you look at the front of it, it's a big circle. So if I'm ever concerned about them not being able to breathe, or if they're having any, you know, like, Respiratory distress, whatever. That's the same thing. But respiratory distress, you can look in and see them. And I can also keep an eye on their eyes. And I also like to keep a lookout on their gum color because sometimes different gum colors can mean different things like gray, blue. You don't want that. <laughs> um, not only is it great <laughs> for aggressive cats, it's also great for really shy cats. 
So if I do have a cat that's really shy, doesn't like the dryer, or doesn't like the sound of the clipper, I will throw that puppy on and they can actually hide in there. With also another good one is um, the happy hoodie. So I'll do a double happy hoodie with the air muzzle. Yeah, no, I do that a lot too. And it's what I like about the air muzzle is that it's good for cats that want to hide um, because they can feel hidden, but I have access to 95% of their body. So I can really get a lot done. I can remove matting. I can give them a bath. I can dry the body. I can do their nails. I can do their sand. I can do their dish. I can literally do everything else without having to worry about it. And a lot of shy cats don't like the blow dryer rushing around the face, which is what I mentioned in one of our previous episodes talking about how to get cats used to the dryer. And one of the things I recommended is using something like the air muzzle to prevent the air from rushing close to their face. So it's good for cats that are trying to bite me because a lot of times they want to look at you. They want to see you. And so they can. And then the cats that want to feel hidden, it's also good for them too. So Gracie, now I know you use um, something else. I use as crazy as it sounds, a towel. <laughs> towels are like amazing. Like I didn't even realize how important towels are in my life until I became a cat groomer. Um, <laughs> I know. You no, know, I probably have like 50 towels. Like I only groom, like I, I finished grooming by like 1230 and I have like 50 towels and I get really weirded out if I'm like running low. And so I, I, wear, I buy towels in bulk. I love to, I, I have to have like multiple stashed in all different places. Because you can use them for, for so many different things. I like to use my towel if a cat gets away from me and I have to chase them around my salon, I can just throw it over them, scoop them up, and scrap them up with my air muzzle on, but make sure you have your air muzzle ready. <laughs> Don't look at this cat and the cat's kind of bite you. <laughs> that would not be good. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> the towel gives you an extra couple seconds, which is nice, which is really important if you're trying to prevent injury. Um, yes. Yeah, but it's not a, it's not a, it's not an air muzzle. It, they can still bite you through it. <laughs> I also like to use it um, for cats that are very wiggly that don't want their nails trimmed. You can also uh, roll about in a Pareto and you can take one paw out, trim their nails. It's also good for cleaning out their eyes. Um, cleaning out their ears. For my cat, if she needs medication, I throw them in a burrito. <laughs> my personal cat, she doesn't like, yeah, nice and snug. It's also really good for the cats the air muzzle cannot fit on or they don't like the air muzzle. So what I actually do, have a, t have a, ha have a towel handy here. Look at me. So prepared. <laughs> I try sometimes. Oh, <laughs> what I actually do, so I roll it up like, well, like this, and then I can actually put it around their neck so they can't whip around and bite me. So when they're in the caddy shack, I was kind of go like that and kind of slide them around. I was just going to say the key with that technique, just for everyone watching, um, is that you're not pulling the head back when you're using the towel like that. You're creating almost a type of e-collar where they can't turn around and you're holding the towel behind them. So you're not pulling back, you're just holding the towel. And so like she's saying, she can kind of slide them around. So that means she's not picking up the cat and she's not like, like reining back on a horse. It's just to keep them from being able to turn and bite you. So this is when they're kind of like laying on the table. But yes, very good for cats that their just head or neck is just way too thick, they're too chunky um, for the air muzzle. It's kind of like a neck brace. <laughs> right, it's like a neck brace, right. It's not meant to choke anybody. We're not, no. we're not choking cats. No, 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 yeah. no choking. Again, it mobilizes their neck so they can't really like whip back and bite you. And then another thing I like to use it for is when I have a cat that's very skittish, I can hide their head underneath the towel. And that helps. If they don't like anything around their head, like a, like an air muzzle or a happy hoodie, a towel usually works. Yeah, just to kind of drape it over their right. head while they have their head like stuck in a corner or something. Yeah. It's good to just be like, here we go. Here's a little, no, you I'll give you a little hiding check. place. Right. Let me just check on you. Right? Yeah. yeah. You're okay. <laughs> um, so while we're talking about muzzles, I really want to talk about the types that I don't care for. Um, I literally only have the e-collar, air muzzle, and towels in my salon. I don't have other types of muzzles, um, but people ask me about them. So I figured we would talk about them. First, I don't really care for mesh or fabric style muzzles. 
I've watched groomers get bit through them. So I don't like being lulled into a false sense of security by that those fabric type of muzzles because they're not going to totally protect you. Um, also, the majority of those soft muzzles, as well as the leather and BDSM themed muzzles, um, they all cover the face. They all cover the face of the cat. And I understand the thought process behind it, which is that you don't want to get bit and that some cats want to feel hidden. But the problem is, is that I can't see what's going on with the cat. So like Gracie mentioned when she talked about the air muzzle, we need to be able to see if they're panting, if there's changes in breathing, if they're, you know, if their gums are getting pale, if their eyes are becoming more dilated, you know, all of those things I need to know about really quickly. And so that's why I like to have them air muzzle because I can literally just look in and see what's going on as opposed to having to take a muzzle off in order to establish if they're showing any of these signs of stress. I don't like that. Um, so again, I, I find that the muzzles that are so, that are totally covering the face are solely about not getting bit um, when it should be about finding the best technique and solutions for each cat, which also happens to include preventing them from wanting to try and chomp at me. Finally, since I'm on a roll, I don't recommend more than two people working on a cat, and even then, it should only be in short bursts. I work totally by myself, and so does Gracie, which means that all the cats that get groomed at our salons are done totally solo. I believe that working in short time spans for removing the painful or difficult areas are best for most cats. I don't want to spend hours picking away at matting. I want to get in, do it safely and methodically, but get that relief to the cat as soon as possible. So I understand why some groomers wanna have a second person assist. One person is holding and paying attention to the cat's safety and stress, while the other person can focus on removing the matting or painful problems without causing the cat any injury. But I do not agree with just holding a cat down for an hour or more while someone hacks at it with clippers. Work as a team to keep the cat comfortable, then use a bit more firmness or pressure while you are honing in on that particular tight section of matting or an ingrown, uh, ingrown toenail or an irritated hunk of poop stuck to their butt. I get it, I really do, because I see that all day in my salon. I'm still the new kid on the block, so I get a lot of what I call the reject kitties. Um, the cats that other salons have turned away, they tend to come to me, or the ones that the vet has referred to me to try before they go full sedation. But I firmly believe that a huge majority of these cats can be done safely, quickly, and totally solo. Um, make sure to check out my previous episode with tips on solo handling. I think that will really help you. But if you need help with that, then make sure to go back and listen to Gracie and Mai's recommendations on training and how to become a master cat grooming ninja, aka a CFMG. So that's going to wrap it up for today's episode of Relax, It's Just Cat Grooming. Thank you, Gracie, for joining me. How can people reach out to you if they have questions or want to know about training with you? So you can either message me on Facebook, it's probably the easiest, just Gracie Owen, two E's, or you can email me at upstatemeow at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you, so, thank you again for joining me, Gracie, and thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, please post them below in the comments, and you might just see them addressed on a future episode of Relax, It's Just Cat Grimming.